Hello, Glenn. How are you going? Hey, Phil. I'm well, Let's, thanks. Uh, Hello, everyone watching from their lovely Yeah, home. welcome. All right, so this is this webinar is just an insurance refresher. Um, so when do you need to update your policies? So whether you've got insurance or not, that also doesn't really matter. It's good just to kind of come on and, and give a refresher. A quick disclaimer, everything I talk about, um, please don't sue me for. It's all general information. It's not personal information. Even if you are a client of ours, I'm not telling you what to do. Uh, so read the product disclosure statement, get personal advice before you act on anything. So what we're going to talk about today, so I'm just going to give a refresher about the different types of personal insurance covers um, and then when you should think about reviewing them and updating them and then how do you actually go ahead and update your policy. And then we'll finish up with a, uh, a lot of time with Q&A. So um, as I said, I think there's a lot of value in the Q&As um, and so we're going to try and dedicate a lot of time to that. Um, so the different types of insurance policies. So the main ones is life insurance or death cover. Um, so what that is, if you pass away, there's a lump sum money uh, that's paid out. Now, there are some nuances with life insurance or death cover. So if you suffer a terminal illness, um, you can get it paid out early. But the simplest way of thinking about it is if you're dead, there'll be money that's paid out either to your estate or to whoever you nominate um, under the beneficiary. Second policy is total permanent disablement um, so tbd um, which is if you're totally disabled and you're unable to work um, because of a health reason so um, physical health mental health um, if you can't ever return to work again you'll get paid out a lump sum payment the next one is income protection so income protection pays you a monthly payment if you can't work for health reasons again physical or mental health if you can't return to work um, then you'll get paid a monthly benefit until you either return to work or until your benefit period ends. Uh, and then the last cover is trauma cover or critical illness is another term for it. And that's really just um, a lump sum payment, so a once-off payment um, that pays out for specific medical events. So the majority of things that pay out on is things like cancers, uh, heart attacks, strokes, but there is a list of 30-plus odd conditions that it can pay out on. So that's just kind of gives us an overview of the different policies that we're talking about. So it's personal insurance cover. Um, and the different ways in which you can get personal insurance cover is really three main ways. So group cover. So you can get it through your super fund or your employer can set it up. So that's just um, a group that is covered under it. So if you're part of that group, so within the super fund, you're part of that group, then you'll be covered under that policy. And the employer, they may set up like an income protection policy for everyone who works in, in the firm or in the um, company. And that'll just, um, that's organised by, by HR and, and the workplace. Um, now, the good thing about that is once you join that group, you're covered by that group policy. Uh, the downside of it is you don't control that policy. So the super fund or your employer can make changes if and whenever they want. So, um, you know, you, if HR says, comes in and says, hey, look, we've got a, a huge bill here for income protection, let's dial this down and, and save us money from the company, well, then they may change the policy. So they can change the waiting period, they can change the benefit period, and they can just change the policy. Same with super funds, they can do the same thing. Second um, way of getting cover is direct, uh, either through in insurance companies or intermediaries. Um, now, often they're... Um, they're easier to get. So you can sign up for it. You can do a medical disclosure um, over the phone or, or online. Um, and often the direct options, they won't um, verify any medical information you have provided them. So they won't go and get a doctor's report to verify it. Um, they will just make sure it's true at the time of claim. So the good thing is it's, it's much easier to set up. The downside is um, if you make a mistake or there's, a, there's an issue with your disclosure, um, the you know, the retail cover may, you know, put an exclusion in the policy or they may limit the cover. The direct cover, they'll just give you the cover and then at claim time, that's when you find out if it's going to pay out or not. And then the third option is retail insurance, so through a financial advisor. So, you know, 75% of the people on this call um, are clients of, of Sky Wealth um, and so we're, we're financial advice business. Um, and so that's retail cover. So the, the benefits um, of retail cover is it's 
what's called guaranteed renewable. So under the Life Insurance Act, the, the policy can never change on you as long as you keep paying your premiums. Um, and the downside is it's, it is much more difficult to get cover. So if you go and you've got any medical concerns um, or, or medical history, the insurance company will do a lot of work investigating that before they'll offer you the cover. They may put exclusions or loadings on the policy because of that health history or family history. Um, so it is a little bit more difficult to, um, to set up, uh, a bit more time consuming, um, but you've got a little bit more certainty knowing that, hey, what I've got and what the policy covers won't change over time. So if I claim on it in 20 years time, the policy I signed up for is the same policy. Um, so there's pros and cons of, of each option. So how often should you review the cover? So kind of the, the main topic is about reviewing policies and, and when you need to um, change it. So every single year you should be checking your policy. So premiums can change over time. So even if you've got level premiums, they can change over time. And the level of cover can change depending on the way you've set up the policy. So if you're under a group policy and your employers change the level of cover, that can just happen uh, on renewal. Um, and if you've got um, group cover through your super fund, a lot of super funds, they do what's called a unitized cover, which they offer you, you know, five units of the policy. And those units, depending on your age, will change. They can increase, but they can decrease. So often, you know, if you look at your policy, you know, after five years, you may have like half the level of cover you thought you had. Um, so always be reviewing your policy and looking at the premiums and the level of cover every 12 months. Now, the next question is, um, and I get often, I get the question often is, uh, should we move policies around every few years, just, you know, similar to car insurance and go shop it around? So the main difference between like car insurance and personal uh, insurance or life insurance is they're very different um, like kind of structures and different insurance companies. So they've, they've got the same word insurance, but they are very different. So general insurance, which is what's the bucket of like car insurance and home and contents insurance. So that's all called general insurance cover. Now those policies are very different. So I actually did a bit of um, research today. There's more general insurance companies in Australia that got shut down by the regulator in the last 10 years than there are life insurance companies in Australia today. So there's heaps more competition in the general insurance market and the way they're regulated is very different um, because life insurance companies, they have to be around for a really long time to come. So they can't just set up shop, give out a whole bunch of policies and then close up you know, a few years, years later because they've got to guarantee that, that claim in the future. The way they assess risk is very different as well. So one thing about like car insurance or home and contents insurance, there's a few data points that's publicly available. So like if you're insuring your car, how old you are, your sex, um, how old the car is, all of those things are pretty easy to identify and assess the risk um, just based on you know, the data the insurance companies have. With personal insurance company cover, they're covering the individual. So you know me and my brother who's two years older than me, our health situation may be completely different. Um, even though we grew up the same way, and, you know, this from, from the same similar data points, but our health, health may be completely different. So the risk assessment is much more strict um, when it comes to personal insurance company uh, cover. The next is the contract terms. So general insurance, like car insurance, they can just cancel the policy after 12 months. They don't need to keep offering it. But per, uh, personal insurance or under the Life Insurance Act, they've got to keep offering that cover uh, until you cancel it or you claim on it. Um, and yeah, and the pool of insurance is different. So there's a lot less insurance companies in the life insurance space and heaps more in the general insurance space. So that's why if um, you want to call up your life insurance um, provider and say, hey, I can get a better discount somewhere else. Can you offer us a discount? They, they will just flat out decline. Um, they don't really um, kind of give discounts like that um, because of the, all of those factors. Now, the, the other thing is reviewing exclusion. So you should be reviewing your exclusion. So if you do have an exclusion on your policy, understanding, you know, if it's reviewable in a certain period of time. Um, and if you've set up through a super fund directly, uh, you may be able to ask the super fund um, or the underwriter of the insurance policy, um, but also a financial advisor. If you've set up through Sky or any other advisor, have a chat to the advisor and see if it will be reviewable. And if so, when's that date? And then you know, note it down into your diary and then review that exclusion then. 
But we do suggest updating um, your policies every time you've got major changes um, to your situation. So some of those major changes um, are things like, you know, changes to debt, um, you know, changes to your family structure, changes to your jobs and, and um, income, starting a family, changes to health situation. Now, it all does reflect on the way in which you set up the policy at the very beginning. So if you follow the barefoot investor and you just cover 10 times your income, well, when your income changes, you cover, you change the cover based on that. If you set up your cover and you think about covering debt and covering income and making sure that your family is going to be provided for if you were to pass away, then all of those things will trigger a need to maybe update the cover. So the way we think about it, we look at it um, a lot more than just the, the level of um, income you have because someone on a hundred grand of income and a million dollars worth of debt probably needs a bit more cover than someone on a hundred and twenty grand of income with no debt. Um, and so that's why we don't really follow the just cover certain times your income. We we factor in a lot more things. So like if you are upgrading your home uh, and buying a new home and getting half a million dollars more debt, well then you, you may want to consider that. Or downsizing, you're paying off heaps of your mortgage and, and you factor that in when you took out your policy, then reducing that at that point in time. Changes to family structures. So if you've got a partner, and um, on your policy, you, you left the life insurance benefit to your parents, then maybe you may want to just change that. It, you may not need to increase the cover or decrease it, but even just changing what's called the beneficiaries on the policy will be really helpful. Um, and then changes to jobs. So sometimes just a change of job may not trigger, like you don't have to change it. And so like if you, you're an accountant, and then you've gone and quit your job and, and decided to work, you know, as a you know, garbage truck collector. You may not want to uh, change your policy then because you may get worse terms. Um, but if you've, you know, you're a builder and then you've become an accountant, well, then, yeah, you may want to go and update your policy because you're probably likely going to get cheaper premiums. And then, yeah, starting your family is a big one. Yeah, debt and family actually are kind of the two biggest ones. Um, and so if you've got... If you're having dependents and someone now relies on you being around more than just your partner who's also working, um, then it's really important to, to um, think about, okay, do I need to increase cover or do I need to take it out in the first place? And then changes to your health situation. So, um, again, improvements to your health, um, like talking about the excluded exclusion reviews and loading. So, you know, if you took out policy and you got a, a loading um, because of a high BMI, so body mass, mass index, um, and you've lost weight over the over the time, reaching back out to your advisor or the insurance company um, and seeing if you can reduce the premiums and remove that loading um, because you've lost weight. So that's a really good way to kind of, you know, warrant a, a review of your policy. Um, and the opposite may also be a determining factor. So if you've had a poor health outcome, so you've you know, diagnosed with cancer, well, it may actually limit any ability to change in the future. Um, so you may not be able to increase your cover or it may be a bit more difficult to increase your cover at that point in time. So now we'll talk about like, what, you know, what's the need to trigger a change? Now we'll talk about like, how do you actually go ahead and change your policy? Um, and again, it does come back to like your philosophy around the cover you take out at, at the very beginning. And, and um, also like, you know, if you if you want to replace income and cover debt and all of these things, well, you know, you may need to recalculate the level of cover you need. Um, but there's really two ways of changing your policy. So one is decreasing the cover and the other, next one is to increase the cover. Or I also like to talk about it in a way of, am I increasing the risk to the insurance company or decreasing the risk to the insurance company? So um, most of the time, if you're increasing the level of cover, then you're increasing the risk because the insurance company, you know, they've got a life insurance policy for half a million dollars. You want to take it to a million dollars? Well, they're going to pay you an extra half a million dollars if you do claim on that. So a decrease of risk or decrease of cover is often really easy. So um, you can often just request this direct to the insurance company or go through your advisor. Um, and, you know, as, as an advisor, we, we may kind of look at, okay, do we just need to recalculate it? And, you know, if you're wanting to reduce your life insurance policy by half a million dollars because you want to save on premiums, which is a legitimate reason why you may want to do that, 
maybe let's have a chat about what are some other things that will impact your premiums at a much greater way, but not have such an impact at claim time. Um, so there are ways in which, okay, do we remove features or change benefits um, outside of just the, let's look at the big number and reduce that biggest number. And then the, the next way to increase your, or to, to go ahead with it is to increase your cover. Now, um, it is uh, difficult to increase your cover. You can move insurance um, uh, providers, um, and there are sometimes good reasons to do that. There are sometimes really good reasons not to do that, um, and really it's all around health. Um, but the, the two ways to increase your cover um, is a full application. So it means uh, full underwriting. If you're going back to your same insurance company, you may need to do paper forms, even though when we first set it up, we didn't need to do paper forms and it drives me mental, but that's the world we live in with insurance is um, they often like to talk to you as a new customer, but once you once you've already got your policy, they, they don't like you as much. Um, but we, you know, that's a lot of the work we do as at Sky. We, we are big believers in holding our policy with the same insurer and just increasing or decreasing if and when needed. Um, but there is a thing for future increases um, or future increase options. So different insurance companies have different um, names for it, but it means that you, you may be able to increase your cover um, for limited or, or no underwriting. So um, now it's, it's limited to often only retail cover. Some direct insurance companies may offer it within the policy. Um, but super funds often don't uh, within their contracts. But what that is, is you can increase the cover um, of your policy um, at certain life events. So it is only, it's only available on specific policies, mainly retail policies um, set up through a financial advisor, and it's different per insurer and per policy. So it is like really complex, and we're going to go into some of the reasons or some of the ways in which you can increase it, um, but like the real answer is read your product disclosure statement um, that you, you got at the time you set your policy up and, and you know, read the 120 page document to work out when you can increase it. Or if you go to financial advisor, send us an email um, or, or your advisor an email. Um, but there are limited criteria and it's, you know, and it is very complex. So at the time in which you set up the policy, there's like a certain series um, with the insurance policy. Um, you know, if you set it up before, 1st of October 2021, it's uh, much easier to increase things like income protection. Since the new income protection policies have come out, it is a little bit more difficult. So it is limited criteria in the amount in which you can increase and when you can action it. It's very important to kind of understand it, but it's very specific events. And it can be different for lump sum policies. So life insurance, your TBD and your trauma versus your income protection. So I'm going to touch on some of the increases. Now, don't be scared. Um, I'm not expecting anyone to kind of go away and understand what this table means, but I'm just showing you this just to kind of give you a sense of what the um, like criteria is. And as I said, it is different for every policy. And at the time at which you set up the policy, it could be different as well. So in terms of the eligibility window, so what that means is, um, and what, you know, what this Excel spreadsheet is, is, I've got three pages of the Excel spreadsheet, but it's different insurance companies rules around increasing it without uh, underwriting. So what that means is they won't do another medical assessment. Now there are a few rules, like if, you're, if you can claim today, then you can't action this um, future insurability benefit. So um, uh, like if you, have cancer and you're ready to claim, but you, you've you had a life event that can trigger an increase, they won't let you increase it and then claim straight away. Um, so the eligibility requirements are, most of them you can see it's within 30 days from the event of happening, which I'll touch on those events, um, and also 30 days of the policy anniversary. So either when it happens, so buying a house is, is a good example. When you buy a house or increase your mortgage, you can action it within 30 days or within the next policy. Um, some of them, uh, you can see, you know, insurance company E, uh, it's just within 30 days from the policy um, anniversary after the event. So not within the, near the event, it's got to be near the policy anniversary. Um, and some are within 60 days of the event, but not the anniversary. So complex um, and kind of tricky for us as an advice firm to kind of work it out. Um, but um, yeah, different rules. 
So now some of the other rules around like how much can you actually increase? You can't just go, oh, I've got, you know, a million dollars and I want to take out $4 million. Um, so the amount of which you can increase for income protection and lump sum, so life insurance, disability insurance and trauma is different. So, you know, you can see insurance company A is the lesser of 25% of the original benefit or $200,000. Some other insurance companies have different rules. Um, income protection, so these insurance companies won't let you increase the income protection in the current uh, in income protection policy, but a lot of them will. And, and you've got to have, um, you can increase lesser of 15% of the current monthly benefit or the maximum um, benefit cap. Um, so yeah, so that's some of the kind of criteria around it. Now, in terms of what are the events or what are those things that you can then trigger and increase? So again, depending on the insurer, it's a whole bunch of different rules and this doesn't make any sense to most people, but I've just touched on some of the life events. Things like marriage. So if you get married, most insurers will let you increase the benefit for, for your life insurance, disability and um, uh, trauma benefit. Birth or adoption, dependent child starting high school, dependent child starting primary school. And you can see there's a lot of things here. Divorce, spouse dying, uh, increased or business loan. So if you've got a business and, and you're increasing the loan of the business, um, there's, there's a lot of criteria or a lot of events there that can, can increase the cover. Um, now I can see there's heaps of questions, which is really good. Keep the questions coming. I struggle to multitask, so I'm struggling to kind of like look at the questions, read them out live. So I'm just going to leave everything to the Q and A. So keep your questions coming, and I'll um, we'll do our best to address all the questions. Um, and I will try and hurry up so I get as much Q and A time as possible. Um, and then you can see with the income protection. Now again, there are you. With the income protection, there's kind of old world income protection and new and today's income protection. Um, so back last year, 2021, um, in October, um, the insurance regulator basically changed heaps of things to do with income protection moving forward. And they said, hey, you can't be as generous with your terms. You've got to make it much harder for people to, um, to claim on and to, to adjust. So these requirements are on today's income protection. The old income protections are much more generous and, and the ability and the events in which you can increase it um, can be a bit easier. Um, but yeah, you can see if your income's increased, then you can potentially um, increase your, your cover. In married, divorce, there is one insurance who, sure, who, who offers that. Um, and, and yeah, there's a, there's a few things. Now, again, the old policies, there were a few more triggers. So if you did have an income that um, was 15, up to 15%, then you could trigger that um, income protection. And there's like a whole bunch of eligibility requirements that you can see. Um, but really, this is all about increasing your cover without going through any underwriting. So if you have had a, you know, a bad back, you took out your policy two years ago, You've had a bad back and so to increase your cover you know you're probably going to get a back exclusion if you've had one of these events we can maybe increase those covers um, without the back exclusion um, and so yeah that's really one of the major things i wanted to touch on today is if if a major life event happens and you've set up your policy through a financial advisor definitely reach out to them around the time even before so you know purchasing a house um these uh, these triggers on purchasing a house or it's, it's on the debt actually. Um, where are we? I'm sure everyone's just looking at it going, it's just there, you idiot. But it's somewhere there, but increasing debt is, um, it's on the settlement of the debt. So buying a house, it, you know, you've got a 60 day settlement, you kind of know what's coming up. So reaching out to your advisor saying, hey, increasing the debt, let us know what, what's going on. Um, so it's really important to um, keep your advisor um, in the loop with any life events. And if nothing needs to change, then, then we'll let you know or, you, or your, your advisor will let you know if there's not much that needs to change with your policy. Um, because as I said, like a lot of these things back in terms of like what life events need to happen. So um, some things that we don't view as needing to cover is investment debt. You go and buy a million dollar investment property. The way I view the world, you know, if you can afford that being alive, and our cover is just covering your income where well, you can afford it if something happens. So we don't, um, we wouldn't naturally tell someone to increase the cover because of that. But again, it's about your own philosophy that you're brought into it um, or your advisor that you've set it up with and what their philosophy is. So I think we're up to Q and A. Yes, Glenn, if you're around, you can come on, help me kind of answer a whole bunch of questions. There's been heaps of questions, which is really good. Um, 
I'm going to start picking yeah. out a few. Um, Phil, is it for income protection? Is it still um, seventy five percent salary? Uh, what you can cover? No, yeah. it's it's seventy percent. No, it's it's very complex. But most policies these days will cover seventy percent for the term of the policy. Yeah. Okay. So. For example, Taryn's question around what would you say is a substantial for an income protection change? So given that we can only cover 70% of your income, if we go, if you had a $10,000 pay rise, you know, that $7,000 of insurable benefit divided by 12, that's a monthly benefit of $583. I think you've got to make a judgment call over, you know, you've got your policy, maybe you've just started in the career and you've got a $60,000 or a $70,000 policy. If you did get a pay rise to $80,000, you've got it like to increase in the main outside of life events, you will have to do underwriting. Mm -hmm. And it gets to the point of, do you want to go through the paperwork for a, like a $580 a month insurable benefit? Um, I would probably think you wouldn't do it less than ten thousand uh, dollars, just for the headache factor of doing paperwork. Yeah. Uh, but like like anything, like you can't wreck it by calling your advisor and saying, "Hey, Phil's team, um, this is my income. What do you think?" And they might ask questions like, "Well, what's your income trajectory look like? Are you getting a pay rise in six months? Yeah, all right. On balance, maybe we wait." Um, so that's all I would say is um, you would do that. And remember, each year, the policies are indexed to inflation. Mm. Uh, so they'll automatically increase yes. with inflation. And that's, and that's what we often will just touch on is say, hey, I just want to inform you, if we can't do this without underwriting, we, sorry, if we have to go through this increase with underwriting, you've got this massive pain in the neck to actually go through this application you've got to fill out paper application form so it's totally up to you we can go ahead we can help you with this 10 grand um, pay rise increase or, or five grand let's say um but it, it'll be a significant workload do you want to do that or if you think you're going to get five grand you know this month six months time you're probably going to get another pay rise then do we just wait uh until later so it's really about reaching out to your advisor have a chat um we'll kind of guide you through well at the end of the day, it's your policy. We're happy to help you, um, but just be aware, it can be painful. And I just want to touch, uh, for example, I made a note, if someone had a $500,000 death policy, for example, and they increased their mortgage and buy another 500,000 and the need was there to increase the cover to a million dollars, and there were health events, the advisor may recommend a different insurance company that would take you based on your health history at the mm. time if your current insurer won't take that medical condition but you can still hold two different policies with two different insurers and they can both be paid yeah yeah that's right all right there's, a, uh, there's so another question a... from taryn um is there an all time frame that exclusions can be reviewed or is it totally variable uh also if you ask for a review of an exclusion that doesn't get lifted is there a chance it can be extended for longer so it's a good question so exclusions are on the life of the policy forever so um an insurance company won't say we're going to exclude this for you know two, two years and then and then you can cover it for most exclusions now as i say that i I um, think about some things like newly self-employed kind of clauses. They run out once you've been self-employed for three years. But for the my main thing, it's on it for the life of the policy. So if you then go and try and get it reviewed, um, they'll, they may do a full assessment of your health. They may just assess that one thing. And then if they say, no, we're not going to remove this exclusion, it doesn't extend that exclusion length because it's on the policy for the life of the policy anyway. So there's no downside doing it. Um, but what we do, and we, we kind of just guide people through and go, hey, give us an understanding. Have you had any symptoms or treatments since we took out the policy? The answer is no. Maybe we'll get this across the line. Um, but what we actually do at the very beginning when we set up the policy, we ask the underwriters, is this ever going to be reviewable? Because sometimes it's just not. Um, and the underwriter will let us know that. Um, mm. Just a, an example on that. Um, you know, not many people smoke like they used to, but 
a smoker status is theoretically a loading on the policy because you're at a higher risk of health events. Now, my father had all his policies on smoker status and he then was diagnosed with cancer, uh, was off work, income protection paid, all that, gave up smoking, uh, was a non-smoker for a, you know a couple of years. Uh, then we went to review the policy and they, even though he didn't smoke, they kept the loading on the policy because he had had cancer. Mm. So, you know, sometimes loadings can be removed, excludents can be reviewed. So and it depends on the insurance about, company as well. Some insurance companies, when we right. review an exclusion, they'll just ask questions about that exclusion. Sometimes they'll go, yeah. hey, we, we, we want to reassess the health because if there's an additional risk, we don't want to yeah, we, we don't want to remove the exclusion for something that's totally unrelated because there's that additional risk uh, shall we shall we go there was a question yeah yeah so there's a question um in what way would children starting school be a reason to change or review policies so that's it's you know you've got to kind of look at this you know with that big chart that phil had sometimes it's an arms race with insurance companies of adding different policy features and the rationale could be uh children starting high school uh children starting primary school um uh, parents who may have not been working may then go to work earn more money and they might increase the debt so it is a bit of a, a life change so that's all it is it's just a bit of a, a sales arms race gimmick between the insurers and, and also if you're spending if you're doing private school fees and you're now you're spending 10 grand a year on private school fees yeah. well your cost of living's gone up and and therefore, but yeah, a lot of insurers, they just put in these benefits to give themselves another mark on the comparison tools and, and so advisors can recommend them. Imogen, how difficult is it to update a beneficiary? Does it have to be done through an advisor? It's very easy and it doesn't have to be done through an advisor. Um, but it's always good to talk with your advisor um, just if you've got any questions. Uh, if the policy is set up in superannuation, uh, you can't just put a beneficiary as your brother or sister because they're not a dependent on you for superannuation purposes. So if you did that, it might not be valid anyway. So it's just a really good um, thing to chat with your advisor about. And there was another policy there. Uh, there was another question there about uh, Michaela. Um, yeah, if you don't have a beneficiary, Actually, this is a very good question, isn't mm. it, Phil? So whoever owns a death policy receives the benefit unless there is a beneficiary. So outside of superannuation, if you self-owned a death policy and there wasn't a beneficiary, it would go to you, which is your estate. Mm. Inside superannuation, the insurance trustee the superannuation owns the policy for your benefit now if you died without a beneficiary it would be paid out at, at the discretion of the trustee so they would say there's no beneficiaries on this please submit your claims let us get as much information as possible that's why in superannuation it's so important to have a beneficiary um, if it's a binding beneficiary, you've had two witnesses sign this and the, the trustee has no discretion mm. at all. They've just got to pay. Yeah, I mean, mo most of the times that, that when that happens, they're not just going to, oh, Joe, Joe Blow asked for this money. Yeah, we'll give it to him. Most of the time they just send it to the estate because it's just easier to manage it that way. Like the trustee of the, of the super fund doesn't want to get into any headache. Yeah, I had a couple. Yeah, I had a couple that were death claims without a beneficiary and um, we just had to do a stat deck. Um, the two kids did a stat deck and say, we've got no claim for this. Um, it can be paid to mum mm. direct. Um, so the trustee just has to do the ticks and uh, check and boxes. The, and the, and for me, I don't that is just to bypass the estate so they don't need to go through probate yes. and, and everything. Because that's the best thing about um, insurance policies is they can just skip the estate. You don't need to go waste your time going through an estate, you know, getting you know, yeah. all of that stuff, you can just get paid out straight to whoever you nominate. But for someone like me, single, no kids, me, death yeah, cover in super. You've put, Sorry. you've put me on, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, Phil, uh, Phil Thompson, a big fat 0%. <laughs> Um, and 100% goes to my estate. So on purpose, I've chosen my estate. So then the benefit can be distributed as per my will. Yeah. A bit, but but I, I just, can I finish on one thing? Also, yeah. the reason you've done that is because from a, from a superannuation law point of view, you probably don't have a financial dependent to pay that out to. So it has to go to your estate. No, I don't. So yeah, you can't, yeah. You can't have a policy owned through your super fund and then pay it out to, you know, the, you know, Dolphin Society. Um, yeah, or my brother or yeah, sister. because it, it can't be paid out. Yeah. Uh, and just for those with kids, and the reason I'm camping on this a little bit, um, I'll keep it very vague. I'm kind of remotely helping a situation at the moment. People in my world, um, husband died, there were kids and a spouse with a mortgage in his wisdom and at the time i don't know what he was thinking or if i don't know why the advisor suggested it but whatever he put his two kids as the beneficiary of his life insurance in super the problem is he died prematurely in his 30s and now the money has to go on trust for the kids which is awesome but the problem is the widow is still left with yeah, a mortgage. Didn't get, didn't get the money. And has to go back to work. Like just the most heartbreaking thing in the world. So that's why it's always good just to go back to your advisor. And if there are kids or different marriages, you can actually set up maybe two policies in super and have one policy be paid to the kids and one to the surviving spouse. So plenty of options for flexibility. Yeah, and you can, you can do a percentage basis. So you can just say, you know, I want I want yeah. twenty eight percent paid to this person. I want you know thirty three percent paid to this person. So uh, let's go. What happens if you so Adam asks? What happens if you don't disclose a pos possible exclusion and later down the track you need a claim on it, and something is found out that you didn't disclose something? Do they pay you out? Is there a fine? Uh, oh, scandal! The scandal police yeah. come and they arrest you. So the answer is if you don't disclose and and um depending on when your policy is set up and it's and it's unreasonable that you didn't know about it so if something happened when you were two you know you didn't really know about it and then it came out at claim time well is it reasonable that you knew that well you were two probably not um but if you've intentionally not disclosed and then there was a claim for that thing the insurance company they won't find you they just won't pay you your claim i i will add to that um what can happen sometimes if you were just so if you and i'll be really dramatic right i had cancer two years ago tomorrow i went and got some policy didn't tell them about the cancer they issued the cover then i died from cancer two years later that's a straight up we're not mm. paying non-disclosure now if there was something like blood pressure that you knew about or a bmi thing that you knew about and you didn't disclose what they can do and it, again, each insurance company is different. And this is why disclosure is so important. They can calculate based on that information at the time, we would have actually charged you more. So we're going to hold back some of that premium from the claim and still get some money. So yeah, it's, well, I mean, it's actually it's, again, actually, it's calculated at a, worse, at a much worse outcome. They would say, you know, your policy was $100, but with that loading, it would be $150. So you got a million dollar policy, but with with one hundred fifty dollars, well, with a hundred dollars, you probably would have only gotten like six hundred thousand dollars worth of cover. So we'll we'll still pay you, uh, and even if your premiums were less. like you know ten grand over that period of time, they'll pay you six hundred thousand dollars instead of nine hundred and ninety thousand dollars. So disclosures like keep me up at night. We freak out about it as uh, in our business, and they're super important um, to make sure they're done properly. Because at the end of the day, that's that's what you're getting paid a claim on. Oh, can I answer this one from Luke? Which types of insurance policies are tax deductible? Is it advantageous to pay out of pocket or via super? So when Phil and his team or your advisor makes a recommendation, we always want to get um, to the, how much cover do we need? And the biggest fallacy, you know, someone might have $200,000 in their super. Well, and if you needed a million dollars of cover, or if you needed a million dollars worth of protection, then you work backwards and go, well, we can self-insure $200,000 because we've got that in super. 
So we only need $800,000 of cover. Once we get to a talking point of the amounts of cover, then we look at structuring for tax, estate planning, and maybe if you're just starting out wanting to save money and you've got a young family and all that, you may put some um, cover in superannuation just to assist with cash flow in the early years while you're getting established. Generally speaking, if a policy is paid outside of super, death, TPD, trauma, the proceeds are not tax deductible, the benefits are paid tax-free. Income protection, you claim it on tax in your own name. If you get paid a $5,000 a month benefit, that 5,000 is treated as taxable income. The issue is in superannuation, the death cover is no tax. So the super fund can claim a premium on the death cover policy. But in Australia, there's no tax on death benefits. So it really is a no brainer to have your death cover paid by superannuation because you're effectively, if you salary sacrifice the premium, you're getting tax deductible death cover and you don't have to pay tax on it if it's paid to a dependent. Mm. So that's a really good loophole. TPD in super, um, the super fund will claim a portion on tax, but the advisor will maybe gross up a little bit to cover the tax payable. Um, so so just, probably just to touch it. on that, so TPD, if it's paid outside of super, there's no tax on it. If it's paid inside of super, there is tax on it, which is a really complicated formula depending on like the older you are, the, the more tax you pay, the younger you are. And and there's also this like, what's the optimal tax way? And also like, how do we just afford these premiums? And you've got to balance that. Like I spoke to a client or a new client just today and she, her policies were set up um, and she was like, they're set up outside of super, but I just from a cash flow point of view, I want to put my income protection inside of super. And it was like, okay, cool. There may be some complications, but you know, even though it may not be the most optimal tax, position from a cash flow point of view it, it suited her much better yeah go would you only increase your cover if you've increased your life expenses just wait not just because of increased income from Haley. i just butchered that question yeah you did but i think what what we do Haley, you you incre you ensure your income based on your income not based on your expenses so you'll always get advice to uh, ensure 100% of your income, aka up to 70% of your income, because that's how much you can insure. Um, it's It really doesn't have anything to do with your expenses. Um, but it's funny, Phil, like I've had clients in the past, they say, oh, I don't want to insure my whole income. So they don't insure the full amount. I recommend the full mm. amount because I've never had a client when they make a claim and they knew that they didn't have the full type of cover waiting periods, I never had someone not regret <laughs> um, cheapening out on the Yeah, cover. and and the thing about like income protection, the, the number that you see on your monthly benefit, so if it's a $5,000 monthly benefit, that's pre-tax monthly benefit as well. So if you look at it, you go, well, mm. I'm taking home less than five grand a month anyway, so that five grand is perfect. Well, once you factor in the tax you're paying, you're only going to get like three and a half grand into your bank account. Um, and so mm -hmm. you just got to also understand that there is tax on that income protection benefit. If you ditch death cover, does this have implications? Should you want to get death cover in the future? I will leave it hard to get. Okay, so Phil, we can answer this by just deleting death cover and say, if you ditch any insurance now, is it harder to get cover in the future? It's the same as asking, if I don't have any cover now, is it harder in the future? Mm. Well, it's always going to be more expensive yeah. because you're at Yeah, that's right. I mean, the death cover is an interesting one because a lot of people think, oh, I'll take the others because I'm alive. But if I don't have kids or, de or dependents or debt, do I need death cover? Let's just remove that. Um, and so, like, it is interesting that. And also, death cover is the easiest one to get. So just if we blanket it and say, if I ditch insurance today because I'm young, healthy, all good in the hood, is it going to be harder to get in the future? The answer is, well, maybe it's going to be more expensive, definitely. Um, and maybe harder if you've got health issues. Um, but just in terms of Dan, I, I wonder if your question is, um, if we just got income protection, TBD and trauma, and then adding death cover later, is that going to be hard? Um, sometimes it actually just doesn't make sense from a pricing point of view. 
a lot of insurers will just throw in death cover for free. It's like, yeah. So there's a as a trick, um, for example, trauma cover, right? In Australia, you don't pay stamp duty on death cover. Now, if you took a standalone trauma or TBD cover out, it will have stamp duty attached to it. Um, now, if you link death cover to that, you don't pay the stamp duty because it's a death policy. And also you get internal discounting with the insurance company. I've got two mil of TPD cover and death cover. I do not need two mil of death mm. cover. I'm single and young and well, pretty, I'm a bit of a fossil yeah. now. Um, <laughs> I've got that. Young, using that generously, but. Yeah, um, but for me, I know in the future I'll need um, death cover when I have a family. Um, I, I'm actually uninsurable right now. Too many health issues, but I know that I've got death cover. It's future proofed. And hey, if I did die tomorrow, well, the family's going to have um, a big party. That's for sure. And often, often we price it. Every every insurance proposal we do, we look at. Even if we don't think you need life insurance, we we price it with life insurance and without. And often it can be cheaper with it. Oh, whoops! I accidentally. Um, click laws and then unclicked it. Yeah, well, Are new medical conditions an issue when updating existing policies? E.g., if income level increases, but you have a new medical condition that hasn't occurred. Okay, so that's similar, Phil, to what I talked about, about you've had the death policy, you wanted to increase it in the future, you've got a medical event, that increased cover will be assessed at current mm. terms. But they can't take away the existing yeah, cover. That, that's right. If you, if you apply for it properly, if you go and if you go and look for a whole new other insurance company and you cancel your existing one and and get the new policy with a new insurer, they'll put the exclusion on everything. So that's why you know in in the presentation I was saying we're big believers in picking the insurance properly, picking the insurance company properly at the very beginning and increasing or decreasing if you need to. So that's why like also if you need to decrease your cover. Just think about it. Okay, will I need this in the next few years? Like, sure, I'm going to save money this year, next year, the year after. But if I'm going to have to increase it and I have a health issue, there can be some issues. And, you know, no one knows what the future is going to look like, but it's always just being, you know, informed and understanding the nuances of it. I My own income protection policy, the first policy that I took out, um, oh, gosh, I would have been 25, so it would have been in 2010, it's got uh, a 30 day waiting period to age 65 and we'll just call it $5,000 a month benefit. I've got, I think three other types. I've got three other slots of cover mm -hmm. on my income insurance when I've increased the cover. So they've left the base one there. The next one I've added and they're like, yep, yeah, you've got a mental health loading. Um, and then I'm like, Exclusion. well, Ex exclusion yeah. sorry um mental health exclusion well i'll i'll put i'll put the additional bits of the policy on a 90 day mm -hmm. wait um so yeah i've kind of got a bit of a mixture that you know because this is the thing phil like your income protection it's for long term or permanent disability mm -hmm. most claims you're back to work within the three month period and that's why having an emergency fund of three months worth of expenses, if you did push your income protection to a 90 day waiting period, you just self insure that first three yeah. months. And I mean, look, it's all just about assessing risk and what risk do you want to take on? What, what do you want to pass on? Question here from Bridget, Phil, do you want to go? Yeah, do one? you have any tips on how to set out medical history when completing forms? Is a timeline approach best, include medication, basic health issues? So um, depending on how you're going about it, if you're going direct to the insurance company, they'll ask you specific medical questions. The way we work in, in our business, so we um, give every, every client has to fill in a massive online form and we call it a really, really, really long and boring online form, um, which we ask heaps of questions. Um, and we just ask for a lot of detail. The more detail, the better for us because as advisors, we'll say, hey, when you stubbed your toe three years ago, that actually isn't an issue, but thanks for telling us. Uh, instead of getting all the way to the end and going, oh, hey, you just went on a mental health care plan, you know, six months ago and you didn't tell us, you know, now we're going to get a mental health exclusion. Um, so, yeah, if you're yeah. working with an advisor who's asking you heaps of questions, they'll kind of guide you in kind of how to articulate. 
and and you really just want to like do it so you know a reasonable person would expect to remember about their own personal health uh if you take vitamins not a big deal um like you don't want to get into the trap of over disclosing uh because they are like yeah and a, a good advisor will coach you through if in doubt just ask yeah So my husband is a construction worker, but will transition a more supervised role off the tools, some office work, but can st still considered blue collar as he will be required to be on site. Is it worth updating his role with the insurer? Can this affect the premiums with a decrease? I'm going to have a run at that with the insurer and build a case that he's technically not on the tools. Yeah, and and insurance companies, the way they articulate occupations, it's not like a blue collar, white collar if you kind of touch on one, you're definitely, you're in that bucket. There's there's a lot of different categories that go up the scale and down the scale in terms of the risk assessment. Mm. So yeah, and reach out to your advisor if we set up a policy for you and, and your partner, Danny, and reach out to us and we'll just get questions about what, is, what are the duties? What, you know, because if he's on site like 5% of the time, that's a big impact as in that will get us a better outcome. If he's on site 50% of the time, then okay, maybe there's no change to the occupation rating. Yeah, I think what just on that, I'll try and draw it really poorly. Um, if this is um, best, can you yeah, see yeah, that? Yeah. And this is the worst. So here is basically you're a coal miner, underground, really high risk, or truck driver. That's like not insurable. He might be like bricklayer, you know, really manual. Um, he might be um, a builder. He might be um, hairdresser. He might be office manager and admin. He might be professional or doctor or something like that. So. There's probably what six or seven categories yeah. of um, occupations with each insurer, and and basically most of them are like triple A, um, B, C, D, and then you know whatever. So Uninsurable. one thing to note: if you are working two jobs and you're a school teacher in one of the jobs, and you're doing two hours an afternoon doing graphic design, and you only want to insure your teacher income. Um, I won't say graphic design. I'll say you're pouring beers at the pub, a little bit more mm. high risk. Um, they will rate your occupation on the most risky job, even if you're not insuring that income, because you'd still be insured yeah. pouring beers. And it, well, it, it does depend. Like we're, we've had clients like that and they've been insured on their main income and the insurance company just said, okay, we're not insuring your part-time job, and but we're not also, we're not factoring in the, re the risk of it. And so... When we talk about occupations and that that rating, it's not it's not necessarily like how risky is it at work. It's more how likely is it for you to return to work. So, D Danielle, like your 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 partner being construction worker, even if his ten percent of the job is is out on site, if he can't go to work because he's in a wheelchair and then he just can't do his job because ten percent is required to be on site. That also is an impact on the the premiums mm -hmm. and the and the occupation rating. So, Josh, oh, this is a good one. Not enough cover cancelling abruptly. Okay, I honestly, I've I've mentioned this before, and I'll repeat it just in case no one can see it. Can you advise the most common mistakes people make regarding insurance? Not enough cover cancelling abruptly. Any examples you can provide? couple of things every claim that i've had on a 90-day waiting period regardless of the financial situation the first thing clients ask is is it too late to change it to a 30-day because you know yes it is too late um you shouldn't have been a tired ass when you took the policy out no joking um but yeah once a claim event happens it's too late to change the policy um not enough cover the biggest mistake is assuming that you're protected or not even thinking about it any default cover that you get in your superannuation fund i can guarantee you it's not enough uh cover it's like if you've got a family if you got debt any default cover in a superannuation fund 
100% will not be enough for what you need. Mm. Canceling abruptly. This is a big one. And Phil, you said it once in a, um, a podcast episode that we did. Like, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Mm. Don't get the little poos with your insurance and just get rid of it. Just reduce the level of cover if you can't stomach any increases. Yeah. And then, look, the cost of living is going up and, you know, there will be pressures. Um, <clears throat> and so... Yeah, it doesn't need to be all or nothing. If you if you don't want a million dollars worth of cover, you don't need zero. You can get 700,000 or half, half a million, like it's up to you. The other mistake I would say, and you know, I'm an advisor, of course, I'm gonna say this is not trusting the advisor to, to have a conversation. That's the thing I I find really funny. Like, you know, we, we communicate this to every client. At the end of the day, it's your policy. You pay the premiums, you do whatever you want. I'll be honest where I believe you're doing the wrong thing. If you're being a silly sausage, I'll say, hey, maybe don't do this. Like just because your partner's not working and earning an income and you think they don't need life insurance, well, you, they probably do because you'd be stuffed because you've got three little kids at home. Um, so, but at the end of the day, I don't pay your premiums. I'm not going to judge you. I don't judge anyone for not taking out cover. So the thing, one mistake I would say is not having conversations with the advisor um, that you're working with. Um, because you know there's this level of mistrust or oh, they're getting paid a commission they're gonna they're gonna you know want me to keep or whatever i can promise you every one of my clients it does not move the needle with with my business um whether we keep cover or cancel it um it, it matters very little to our bottom line or our business um if if the advisor is telling you something for the most part they're gonna well i mean all the time they're gonna do it with your best interest um if I think you shouldn't cancel cover, and I'll tell you that, but I'll follow up with, I never pay your premium, so it doesn't matter what I say. So just just have a conversation I, with the advisor. Yeah. We're here to have. You're a really you're a really nice guy, Phil. I wouldn't work with clients, uh, particularly if they had young families who didn't want to at least get death mm. cover. Well, I just it's a non-starter for me because I don't actually respect the decision that someone wouldn't want to uh, protect their family. Like I just think it's. And this is me being hardline, like, I'm just like, that's selfish. It's like a couple of grand a year, yeah. like, but look, that's fine. I, but that's come from me actually doing claims and having to help people that I know after a death has happened without insurance. Mm. And if someone came to me wanting to do financial planning, this is why I did my sound financial house, insurance first, emergency fund wills and estate if you didn't want to do it that way i don't want any part of your scaffolding because i think you're doing things the wrong way mm. um uh phil what time does this webinar finish i'm just conscious of the well time. Let, i mean i don't know how many more questions we've got we've got a lot we can keep going my kids are going to run in the front door in like 20 minutes so um we can run a bit over if we've got any um any questions we haven't addressed um, we can kind of reach out to myself directly, but let's let's get going. Answer. Oh, Taryn had a comment. Taryn's a client of yours, Phil. Fantastic. Of Sky. Amazing outcome. Amazing. I can my husband. So yeah, and and that's it. Like, there's a question here about um, consolidating covers. There's there's no kind of joint policies anymore. It's not the '80s because there was back in the day you could have like weird joint policies. Everyone just and back in the day you, they used to do like cross own policies. So if there was a spouse and their partner, they would own policies on each other. But it's just it yeah, it's done. it's not like health insurance where you've got like a individual health insurance, a couple's one, and a family's one. A personal uh, insurance it's all individualized. So you can be in a partnership and one has insurance with one insurance company, another one has another insurance company, and it doesn't have that much of an impact. He, he's a good one for you, Phil. Yeah. Great. How will death cover pay out for an immigrant with no Australian beneficiaries? Well, generally, the trustee will do the best thing possible in trying to track down... Um, a de dependent or a, an estate heir or mm. something it's it really is up to the discretion it's a good question i mean look 
My answer is I'm not a lawyer um, and I don't do estate planning law. So um, don't know the actual mechanisms um, with it, but I would just make sure um, you've got a you've got a will set up and and the the money, the beneficiary is your estate. So that's one thing that Glenn touched on before. You can make your beneficiary a individual um, and you can make it actually to go directly to the estate. So there's no discretion for the trustee. Yeah, but if it's an individual, they've got to be a, a dependent for CIS purposes, and that is a spouse or partner, a child under 18, or someone who's financially dependent on yeah. you. Um, okay, how many more questions have we got? We're going, I'm going up a little bit. Um, so here we go. Anyway, so back to Dan's question. I think Dan had the question about death before. Um, if you don't have any, uh, if you don't have dependents, might it make sense to ditch death cover and put that money towards high levels of TBD, income protection, and trauma? Because Dan's question, I don't know if it came after this question um, or before, but just about, you know, do we need death cover? If I ditch it, it's going to be harder to set up later. Um, generally, that could be true. You could do that and not have death cover. Often, most insurers will just price it all together and it'll actually be cheaper. You can actually get more TBD, income addiction, trauma, and life insurance than not to have it at all. Yeah, I mean, on this one that Taryn asked, I, look, never say never, but I know you did say it before, Phil. Um, there's a lot happening in like medical advancements and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, diabetes was a big deal in insurance land and it's not anymore. It's uh, just considered a, um, I don't know what the medical term is, but just an ongoing, if it's well treated mm. or whatnot, that's what I'm saying. Um, I, it's, you've just really, this comes down to understanding in your head the risk that I'm taking this policy with an exclusion. Mm. Now I've got a right ankle exclusion on my policy. If I was in a car accident and a bus hit my car and my right ankle got crushed because of the accident and I couldn't walk ever again, the insurance company would likely pay that out because it would have happened to anyone. It wasn't because I was lifting a fridge on the weekend and I hurt my ankle that way. So I think it's just being aware of what your policy is and keeping in uh, constant contact with your advisor every couple of years and life happens right but please come up to air at least every couple of years to, with your advisor and they'll have notes on the system about the exclusions the loadings and you know yeah it's just it's an ongoing thing. yeah so i mean I and exclusions they're pretty rare to be non-reviewable like um you know things like scoliosis will sometimes be if you've got scoliosis you get a back exclusion because it's quite severe insurers will say look it's probably not reviewable um but that's that's the you know the exception and not the rule most times underwriters you know sometimes they say hey we can't give you an indication um of when it's reviewable sometimes i'll say hey yeah we can clearly see this is the last symptom of treatment three years ago so give us another two more years um but it's pretty rare that it's non-reviewable. Um, but that said, they're not going to just magically get rid of it all the time. Um, and so, yeah, definitely reach out. Um, Taryn, I know um, you're a client of ours, so, yeah, reach out. We can have a chat. Um, all right, cool. We've got a question from Paul. Go, Glenn. There was a big, there was a big jump in my premiums from last year to this year. Is this typical or is this a particularly bad year for, yeah. Look, the whole life insurance, income insurance industry has just gone through a huge overhaul in the last few years in Australia. With rock bottom interest rates and really good policies, insurance companies were paying out more than what they were earning off the premiums. And to make it sustainable, they've had to increase premiums. I suspect that that's going to start to settle down now that the new policies aren't as easy to claim on. And look, if you can't work and you're legitimately ill or injured and you've got a policy, you will be able to make a claim. It's some of these policies that, you know, and I know of companies that they've had self-employed people on claim 
and the policy was that good, they could cook the books and dodge it up and they couldn't get the people off the claim because one of the policy definitions was around earnings in the business. So all that's kind of changing now. Um, so I think over the, you know, the coming years, income protection pricing will really settle down. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, just to wrap some some numbers, at the end of the day, insurance is about is, is a business. Um, the and look at it as a bank account. When there's a bank account, everyone who's insured puts that money into the bank account. When you need to claim, pull the money out of the bank account. For five years up until the financial year ending in 2020, insurance companies, life insurance companies in Australia lost $3.2 billion over that five-year um, period of time. Most of that was on income protection. Now, the last two financial years, um, since then, they've, they've made a profit, not a big profit, a small profit. Um, but the other thing to note, yeah, as Glenn said, is the money that goes into that bank account is premiums, but also the money that goes into that bank account is investment returns. So interest rates increasing, although there's a massive pressure on you know household budgets, from an insurance company's point of view, they've got heaps of money sitting there in cash just doing nothing. And then when interest rates go up, they earn a lot more money on that return on investment. So a big portion of their actual overall revenue comes from investment returns. So um, interest rates going up is good from a sustainability point of view. Now, will we see increases moving forward? It won't, I can, I mean, never say never, but I can almost guarantee it won't be what it was over the last three years because that was crazy increases. Um, but there may be small increases moving forward. Um, but there was also an interesting thing with insurers. They weren't, none, no one was increasing their premiums when they should have. They lost $3.2 billion and no one increased premiums almost across the board. And then the floodgate. And it, and it was, and it was kind of like an arms race. Like we talked about all these little benefits mm -hmm. about increase your cover with no questions if your kids go to school and every insurance company was tacking on these things to get to the top of the, the sales pool. But I, I will say, and I think we probably should wrap mm -hmm. up, Phil, um, if an advisor is recommending you cover or someone in Phil's team, the remuneration or premium that the advisor or the commission that the advisor is paid, it's the same for every single company. It's mandated. So an advisor won't put you with an insurer because they're getting paid more. That's rubbish and it's just a myth that's not fact. So you've got confidence that um, they're really acting in your best interest. Um, they're not just increasing the the cover to get more commit. Like it really is splitting hairs. Like if someone took one point two million dollars a cover, a million dollar, it's probably five bucks for the advisor. Like it's not moving the needle. And a good advisor will just detail you why we think you need this type of cover. Gets you to a talking point on price, and you might say, "Yep." If I halve the premium, might halve the price ish. Yeah. Like, make a judgment call. Phil's not going to get sued for recommending too much cover. If you know, you might get sued for not recommending mm -hmm. enough. And that's the the dance with advisors. And um, I can probably speak freely because I'm not an advisor anymore. Um, but you know, the the black and white recommendations are based on a house view of we believe you need this much cover. That's our recommendation. That's what you've paid for. However, you're an adult. We don't want you to spend all your money on insurance, but we don't want you to take all the risk either. We need to outsource some of the risk in mm. your life to an insurance company. Yeah, and, and our view is always we'll tell everyone, like, how much cover they need. Do we expect any exclusions or loadings? Because that makes up, like, you know, 80% of the workload that we put in is making sure we're, we're recommending the insurer who's going to get the better or, or the better outcome, but a, a good outcome. Um, and then we'll tell you how much it's going to cost you. Um, but at the end of the day, I never pay anyone's premiums. Um, we've got clients on the call. I can, they're all going to, you know, attest to the fact I've never paid anyone else's premiums other than my own. So at the end of the day, it's everyone's choice whether that you want more cover or you want less. It's totally up to you. You know, a good advisor will just kind of work with you and go, okay, you want to reduce your life insurance benefit? It's going to save you five bucks. Maybe change something else if you want to decrease the cost. Like they, and that's what we do with our clients. We try and work with them and go. At the end of the day, you're not an insurance expert. We are. We'll kind of guide you in, like, what are the things that you can remove that doesn't have that big an in impact on the claims experience if you ever need this? Um, so, yeah, so as I said at the start, we are giving away books. Where, well, this book, yeah. 
giving away this book. We'll reach out to people or people in my team will reach out, um, try and give them away, get rid of the books on that bookshelf. Uh, amazing book. If you've already got it and we're going to send it to you, give it to someone for Christmas. Best Christmas gift you will ever give them is financial freedom. Isn't that right, Glennie? That's right. And I mean, it's a it's a really good book. It covers a lot of ground. Um, I had a lot of fun writing it. And yeah, I hope that everyone has been encouraged tonight to, you know, either retweet their policies or mm. if you don't have any insurance, consider having an insurance review. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of the, the last thing I was just going to say. If, you, if you're a client of ours or not a client of ours and you just want to chat about your policies, just reach out to our website um, and, you know, get, get in touch with us. You can book in a phone call pretty easy um, and we can talk about, you know, are there any changes to your policy? If you've got any questions about your current policy that we've set up, we can kind of look on that system and answer any other questions. The other thing is we are, you, we are going to send out a... Uh, feedback form, I'm really, really, really keen on doing these more often and getting better at them. Any feedback will be really helpful, negative and positive. I kind of reached out to a client who gave us good feedback. Like everything was raving, 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 mad fan. And then one thing was like, oh, but it could have been better here. And I was like, I'm jumping on the phone. We're having a chat. I want to get a really good understanding about how do we be the best at what we can be. So there's a feedback form. Please fill it in. And be as brutal as you want. You know, Glenn, he should have more hair. Yes, I know. We can't do much about that. But um, all feedback is welcome. So thank you, everyone. Um, people who jumped on late, there is a recording. It will get sent out to you. So um, feel free to um, jump on the recording, reach out to us. Oh, there's a, a thing that's popped up. If you did want to um, chat with one of Phil's team, um, yeah, just grab that link, click on it. And just goes to our website. Yeah, just see how that goes to the yeah. website. You can book in a time. And maybe we just wait a couple of minutes while people do that. But, um, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone, and hanging out on a Monday night. Um, you can tell I, I'm a little bit rusty. I haven't been in the trenches with insurance, but my passion is still the same. No, it was good. Yeah, there, I mean, there was a few things. I just got to make sure, you know, we don't say anything too wrong. Um, but, uh, no, it's good. I mean, at the end of the day, like insurance, at its core, it, there are a lot of nuances, but at its core, it's just about making sure you pay someone money, the company money, if something really, really bad happens, they give you a heap of money in return. So like I've paid heaps of premiums and never once claimed on it because I know that other people who have paid premiums for one year, two years, five years, have gotten millions of dollars in return um, for that. And that's really the best and worst thing about insurance. Um, like you, you, you got some money in return once, yeah, I had a uh, melanoma cut out of my leg and um, I, it was a partial trauma benefit because it was a malignant melanoma. Yeah. So it's a $20,000 benefit. Yeah, I mean, you prefer not to have the melanoma, but you had it. Oh, the 20 grand was pretty helpful. <laughs> you, may as well, you may as well take the money. Um, all right, cool. We're going to end it here. Um, thanks, Glenn. Really appreciate you jumping on. Thanks, guys, and thanks, everyone, for sticking around. I had a great night. Awesome. Thanks.